Good to see everyone here today. Amen. Psalms 51. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. We we'll skip to 14. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God. Thou God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of thy righteousness. O Lord, open thou my lips, and my mouth shall show forth thy praise. For thou desirest not sacrifice, else would I give it. Thou delightest not in burnt offering. And verse 17 is where I get my, my title from here. It says, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. O oh God, thou will not despise. I want to title this thought today, a broken and a contrite heart. A broken and a contrite heart. If you'll go with me before the Lord in prayer, Lord, we thank you, Lord God. Thank you for this day, Lord God. Thank you for your love and your kindness, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord God. We could stand here all day just giving you thanks, Lord God, because you've been so good, Lord Jesus. I pray you touch my mind today, Lord God. Touch my heart, Lord God, as I speak to this, your people, Lord God. Give us all, Lord God, a heart, Lord God, to receive this word today, Lord God. And give us a mind, Lord God, that this word may go in, Lord God, and it may dwell in our hearts, Lord God, for the days to come, Lord Jesus. In Jesus' name we praise and thank you. Amen. You may be seated. Psalm 51. Psalm 51 is a psalm which is written by David. And we see in this psalm, we see a man who is pleading to God. A man who knows he is wrong. A man who is broken in his heart. And we may be trying to figure out why. Why is he expressing these words at this time? And to understand that, we would need to recount the events of 2 Samuel chapters 11 and 12. In chapter 11, you see, David was supposed to be in battle, but decided to stay in Jerusalem and never has the saying been more true that idols hands are the devil's playground Bathsheba went out to cleanse herself from as women know their uncleanness this is what the Bible has how the Bible puts it that's when David saw Bathsheba washing herself from the roof of his house the scripture says she was beautiful to look upon, and it caught David's eye. But David did not look away. He liked what he saw, and he wanted it. He asked about her, and someone in his house said, Isn't this the daughter of Iliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? With all this information, David still sent for her anyway. And then he lay with her, knowing that she was another man's wife. When he learned that she was with child, he called for Uriah, who was at a battle, to come back. Come home. He then tells to Uriah to go into his own house. But we find that Uriah slept at the door of the king's house. David's servants then come and tell him that Uriah is sleeping at the door. He did not go into his own house. David was banking on Uriah to get to his house. Has anyone been apart from their spouse for a significant period of time? You know, when you get home, men, and you see your beautiful bride, you get ready. You are ready. And especially when you're a soldier because you've been with men who stink, don't take care of themselves, 
Don't look good. So that R&R is something different when you come home. It's like looking at your wife with new eyes. I don't have any witnesses in the house today. Mm. Pastor Ellis, I guess me and you the only ones who've been overseas here. Everybody else not telling the truth. (laughs) So David asked Uriah, why? Why don't you go to your house? And Uriah answered in 2 Samuel 11 and 11. He said, the ark and Israel and Judah abide in tents. And my Lord Joab and the servants of my Lord are in camp in the open fields. Shall I then go into mine house to eat and to drink and to lie with my wife as thou livest and as thy soul liveth? I will not do this thing. Now, I was talking to one of my brothers about this. And we were talking about how this was a low key. Throwing shade. Uriah throwing shade at I'm talking to the young people. Y'all get it. He's throwing shade at at David. David, you at home, but we need to be out here in the war. Why would I do this thing? See, Uriah is thinking of all the people, the ark, the glory of God and his leaders that are out at war. So he would not do what David expected any man to do. Uriah was loyal. He was loyal to God and he was loyal to the cause of the people. And when Uriah wouldn't go to his own house, David sent a letter to Joab to put Uriah in the front of the line of the hottest battle and for them to withdraw from him so that he would be killed. And it was so. And after that mourning period, David then took Bathsheba to be his wife. And scripture said that David, the thing that David had done had displeased the Lord. And I need us to look at this a little more in depth. And there are many things that I want us to consider. And I know if you've been in church for any amount of time, you heard this story a million times. Usually it's on the topic that God can forgive any sinner and any sin. And and that is true. I don't want to go against that. But I need us to look at this from our own perspective. See, David, he doesn't represent the sinner. David represents the saint. And I know sometimes that is a hard concept for us to grasp. David had been anointed by the prophet Samuel. David delivered his sheep from the lion and the bear by the hand of God. David had delivered the Israelites from the hand of Goliath and the Philistines by God using him and the stone from the slingshot. God had allowed him to have a seat on a throne. He entreated God time after time and God had given him many victories for his people. He was us, the saints. God has delivered us so many times. We've seen giants in our lives be toppled. We've seen God do so many things through our hands. We have entreated God and he has answered. We've seen breakthroughs. And we've been filled with the anointing through the Holy Ghost. But in this scenario, we are David. See, David's first sin was he lusted after Bathsheba. And I want to tell you that any sin in our thought lives, any sin in our lives that goes unchecked can lead to other sins. That sin was in his mind and it led him to his next sin because David then committed adultery, the physical act of sin. Church, we need to renew our minds. We need to acknowledge the worldly desires that are in us because if we let that sin in our mind fester, then that will lead to physical sin. James 1 and 13 in the Amplifier version says, let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For temptation does not originate from God, but from our own flaws. For God cannot be tempted by what is evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each one is tempted when he is dragged away, enticed and baited to commit sin by his own worldly desire, lust passion. Then when the illicit desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin has run its course, it gives birth to death. I want to read you a quote from Matthew Henry's commentary on this verse. He says, then when lust has conceived, it bringeth forth sin. That is, 
sin being allowed to excite desires in us, it will, ripe, it will soon ripen those desires into consent. And then it is said to have conceived. The sin truly exists, though it be in embryo. And when it has grown in its full size in the mind, it is then brought forth in actual execution. Stop the beginnings of sin, therefore, or else all the evil it produces must be wholly charged upon us. End quote. We must stop these thoughts. We must stop these desires in our minds. See, we all have proclivities and desires of our hearts and the desires in our flesh. Just because you got filled with the Holy Ghost and got baptized doesn't mean that your flesh goes away. You don't get baptized and become immune to your flesh. Your flesh stays with you and it wars with the spirit. Galatians 5 and 17 tells us that the flesh and the spirit are contrary to one another. They war against each other. They are at enmity with one another. So our thoughts can give birth to our sins. When we dwell on our heart's corruptions and their lust, then it would lead us to our sinful action, which ultimately lead to our spiritual death. God does not have that desire for us. He wants us to live. That's why he came from glory, put on flesh to die for us, to die for our sins. And he rose again that we might have life and we might have it more abundantly. That's what God wants for us. And he sent us his spirit so that we can have the strength to overcome these desires of our flesh. We must tap into the spirit to stop sin at its inception which is in our mind. We cannot be conformed to the world, but we are to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. That's why we must pray with the Spirit and with understanding. And when we don't know what to pray, the Spirit knows our infirmities and knows our weaknesses. And the Spirit will make intercession for us with groanings, which cannot be uttered. David did not look to God. He tried to trick Uriah, and then he had Uriah killed. Then he took Bathsheba as his wife. David heaped more sin upon himself by trying to cover his sins. When we try to cover our sins, church, we won't prosper. Proverbs 28 and 13 says, He that covereth his sins shall not prosper. We make it worse. David was trying to cover his sin. This is the human nature of us as saints who still have somewhat of a God conscious, meaning that we know what we did was wrong before God, but our human attempt is to try to cover it up. The Bible doesn't give us clear insight as to why he did it. He may have been trying to protect his position. He may have been trying to save face. His why is not that important. What is important is that no matter what he did, he couldn't cover it from God seeing it. We have people today who may be sitting right among us with covered sins. We try to cover our sins because of our positions. A lot of us try to cover our sins because we are afraid to lose these positions. We try to cover our sins because it will be embarrassing not just for us, but for our families as well. We try to cover our sins because we think if someone finds out, they may try to ostracize us, try to drag our names through the mud. We try to cover our sins for so many reasons. They sound reasonable. But we must remember that covering your sin will lead you to not being able to prosper in the Lord. We cannot cover our sins. And I'm not saying, I'm not a fool. I'm not saying you can go around just telling everybody that you sin. But you need to realize that your sins cannot be hidden from God. You cannot think the things that you've done over the span of your life has not been seen by God. You cannot think that the most wicked desires of your thought life, as well as the most heinous acts you have committed, have not been visible to God. You can try covering it all up. You can try it, but all that does is heaps more sin and more sin into your life. 
and you can end up dead in your sins. You can't hide your sins from God. You can't justify your sins to God. And you can't blame your sins on anyone else in front of God. He knows all. He knows the very desires of our hearts, the very thoughts in our minds. But that's what we try to do. We try to cover our sins. The Lord sends the prophet Nathan to David. And Nathan gives David a scenario of a rich man and a poor man. The rich man, he says, has many flocks and many herds, but the poor man only has one lamb. The poor man grew the lamb and fed it from his own food and from his own cup. And now when a traveler came, the rich man did not want to feed the traveler from his flock, but took the poor man's only lamb to feed the traveler. This made David angry. And he said, that man should surely die. And that man should restore fourfold because of what he had done and because he had no pity. David knew what repentance was. He was talking about giving meats for repentance, restore fourfold. And Nathan tells David, he is that man. The Lord sent the man of God to David to confront him. In his sin. And once he tells David the story and David's anger is kindled, he then holds up that mirror to David. Nathan said what the Lord had said, that he anointed David to be king of Israel and delivered him out of Saul's hand. That he gave him David his master's house. That David had many wives already. Everything that David had could be attributed to God. Giving it to him. And if he didn't have enough, God would have gave him more if it was too little. But Uriah, the poor man, only had one wife. And David, to feed his flesh, took from the man and killed him by the hand of the Ammonite. The Lord had to send the prophet to David because his conscience didn't lead him to repentance. His knowledge of the law didn't lead him to repentance. The evil deed he did in itself did not lead him to repentance. David needed to know that his sin was not hidden and there was a consequence for his sin. It could not be hidden from God. The kids would say today he's called him 4K. Saints, when your conscience does not convict you of your sin, when the spirit cannot convict you of your sin when the word of God cannot convict you of your sin God will send his appointed spiritual authority to hold up the mirror in your life and your response in that time means everything it means everything for your today it means everything for your future and I need you to see this I need you to grasp this David was king but the spiritual authority was Nathan. God spoke to David through Nathan. Church, no matter what authority God allows you to hold in this life, he has some spiritual authority appointed into your life. Don't miss that. David didn't just answer to God. He needed that prophet. He needed that priest. And we need our spiritual authority as well. We need our pastor who prays and covers us and shepherds us. We need our leaders. Wives need their husband and children need their parents. God has appointed spiritual authority all throughout our lives, and we must recognize them as such. Because oftentimes that authority is the last effort of God trying to keep us from a spiritual death. It is oftentimes his last effort to lead us back to submission to him. And his word and our submission to him will often come through our submission to leadership. When this happened, David repent. This is what he said. This is what led him to write Psalms 51. This is why we see him pleading to God. Psalms 51, he says, have mercy upon me, O God. 
according to thy loving kindness, according to the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. I don't want to be unclean. And cleanse me from my sin, for I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. David is throwing himself upon God's mercy. He's pleading to God. He is acknowledging the very acts of sin that he committed. Saints of God, when we sin, we must acknowledge the very acts that we have committed. We must throw ourselves on the mercy of God. He knows every temptation that we have to face. He knows the very trying of our flesh. He knows because he's been where we have been. Hebrews 4 and 15 says, For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Church, we have a God who knows our every weakness. He put on that flesh and dwelt among us. He knows what pulls at us and he allows us the opportunity to be able to come to the throne of grace to find mercy, to find grace, to help us in the time of need. He allows us to have an opportunity to confess our sins and to be cleansed. First John 1 and 9 says, if we confess our sins, this was written to saints. This is not written to sinners. This is written to each and every one of us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But in order to get to that place, we must have what David described in verse 17. He says, the sacrifices of God are broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. Oh God, thou will not despise. We need to be broken. See, David realized that his sin wasn't just against mere man. It wasn't just against Bathsheba. It wasn't even against the prophet Nathan or the people of Israel. When he was shown his sin, he realized his sin was against God. He broke, it broke his heart. And he wrote in verse 4, he says, Against thee, thee only, have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest, and be clear when thou judgest. Lord, I've sinned against you, so your judgment will be righteous. It will be sure, sure and justified in what it is. When we are being shown our wrongs, we need to realize that ultimately our sin is not against others. Our sin is not against ourselves. Our sin is ultimately against God. When we hurt our brothers, our sin is ultimately against God. When we lie, it's ultimately against God. When we drown in our drunkenness, it's ultimately against God. When we dabble in pornography, we're ultimately sinning against God. Whatever we do that is against God's word, it is sin, and it is ultimately against God. And that should break us. It should break us. If God has tried to reach us countless times, it should break us. If God is going to have an intimacy with us, church, it takes a broken spirit and a broken and a contrite or remorseful heart. That's not just tears. That's not just saying I'm sorry with my lips. It's a heart that is in despair and ready for change. David's heart despaired. It was broken once he was Faced with his sin, he knew the implications were more dire than the punishment that the prophet had spoken. That's why he said, deliver me from my blood guiltiness. He said in verse 11, cast me not away from thy presence and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. See, the spiritual death I've been talking about, the spiritual death that we speak of, David didn't want to experience. 
David didn't want to experience, and we should not want to experience it either. We should not want to experience being unable to feel the presence of God when we walk in the house, when we get on our knees to pray. We should not want to experience the inability to have a relationship with God because sin puts distance between us and God. We should not want to experience the bearing that weight of the guilt. We should not want to experience the feeling of not having a praise in our hearts. We should not want to experience the spirit not being able to dwell with us and to make change in us. That's what David didn't want to experience. Cast me not away from thy presence. Restore to me the joy of thy salvation. I need your joy, oh Lord. That's where God wants us. That's where we need to get to, to be to get back in intimacy with him. We need a broken heart. And a contrite heart. <laughs> David's predecessor did not have the same heart as he did. Saul had a similar running with sin. His proclivity was he wanted to do whatever he wanted to do. It was rebellion. In 1 Samuel 15, he was told by the prophet Samuel to go and destroy all of Amalek, down to the camels and even every last donkey. But Saul didn't do so. He kept the king of Agag and all the best sheep and lambs, and all that he deemed that was good. And God sent his messenger to Saul, just like he did to David. And when Samuel confronted Saul with his sin, Saul did not accept responsibility. He did not take accountability. He did not repent. He blamed the people and said, they kept the sheep. They're the ones who kept the sheep. And Saul even tried to wrap it in religious packaging and said, he saved the animals to offer to the Lord and sacrifice. Samuel told Saul that obedience is better than sacrifice. And Saul would not be broken. He did not offer true repentance. Thus the Lord rejected him from being king. And the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul. And the Lord directed Samuel to anoint David to be the next king. The Lord knew Saul's heart would not break to lead him to repentance. And that's a scary place for us to be. Because again, Saul was one of God's people. But the Lord did not remove him immediately from the throne. He became very harsh and even murderous to David who was already anointed to be king. And that led David to have to run for his life. Many of us would be quick to remove Saul. We would lambast him or criticize and attack him. But David did not do so. David had many opportunities to take Saul down during that time. Once he was, when Saul was trying to kill David, David had Saul in a cave and could have taken his life. But he cut off a piece of Saul's robe, and that was even too much for him. He said in 1 Samuel 24 and 6, The Lord forbid that I should do this thing unto my master, the Lord's anointed, to stretch forth my hand against him, seeing he is the anointed of the Lord. David also had another opportunity in 1 Samuel 26 where where Saul had chased David into the wilderness. And catch this, the Lord had caused Saul to go into a deep sleep. And Abishai said, surely God had delivered Saul into your hand. We should smite him. And David said in 1 Samuel 26 and 9, destroy him not. For who can stretch forth his hand against the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? What am I saying? This is what we need to know in the presence of harsh and irrational leadership. We need to be like David and let the Lord do what he's going to do because he is a righteous judge. God doesn't take just take down leaders because we think he should. And in the time and we think it should be done. He does it in his own time. And even though the opportunity may arise for us to do what God may have already called us to do, we need to let the Lord be the final judge. So even though your pastor may be down and you've been called to preach, that doesn't give you the right to remove him from the position that God had gave him. 
Even though your ministry leader had, may have fallen and God told you that you would be in that position soon, that doesn't mean that you go ahead and push them out of the way. I'm going to get this into your house, into your job. Even though the supervisor at your job may have experienced failures and it's been prophesied to you that you would have that job, that doesn't mean you go and point out their failures so that you can take over. God may be testing your character. God may be testing you to see if you view authority the way that he does. David viewed it in that same light. The Lord did eventually take, take down Saul, but it wasn't right away. And I believe that there's a reason for this. Second Peter 3 and 9 says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God wants every man to come to repentance. He is long-suffering to each of us in that way. And I don't know. I don't know where the church went wrong. Where we're not helping God in that aspect of helping people come to a broken heart and to repentance. The first thing we want to do is condemn our brother. We don't want to pick him up. We don't want to help him. Church, we are supposed to be the hands and the feet of Jesus. We're supposed to touch people Help people because God is long suffering towards us. He's long suffering towards us. We should help our brothers. But here we are. And I'm sorry, I'm getting off topic. I don't apologize for what I'm saying, but I'm getting off topic here. We become Saul. We're coming to church every week in pretense, acting like we're still king. We're putting on a facade of what we are and who we are, knowing that God has left us. He's given us the opportunity to come back to repentance. When the man of God comes to us, we have a a nasty spirit and a nasty attitude. We got too many souls, not enough Davids. God is calling us to repentance and we get so jealous because we see David, we see our brothers and God working in his life and God giving him victories over everything in his life and what we want to do is we want to kill him. That's not what the church, that's not what God called the church to be. We should rejoice when our brothers rejoice and we should be sad when our brothers and sisters are sad. Church, when your pastor comes to you, showing you where you messed up, you need to have the heart of David. Because God wants everyone to come to repentance. God is long-suffering. He'll give you time after time, but he is not slack concerning his promise. He's just long-suffering. He's long-suffering. He wants us to come to a place of repentance. He wants everyone to be able to come to a place of a broken heart. And even when he knows our hearts, he still affords us every opportunity to come to the throne of grace to obtain mercy. Saul didn't make it back to God, but David did. These aren't stories of unbelievers, but these are events of God's own people. And God still loved them enough to bring attention to their sin and afford them the opportunity to have a broken and a contrite heart and to come to repentance. I think we should all thank God for his long suffering to us. Thank you, God. Thank you for every opportunity we have to come. 
before your throne of grace and mercy, Lord God. So, Lord, I come to you, Lord Jesus. Broken, Lord God. Thank you, Lord God, for this opportunity, Lord Jesus. Lord, we thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Lord. There's a parable that Jesus tells us in Luke 15. And this is a parable of, and is, this parable is the last parable of three parables that God tells in succession. He tells a parable of the lost sheep. He tells a parable of a lost coin. But his final parable of these three is the parable of the prodigal son. This son was the younger of two sons. He said to his father to give to him his inheritance. He's basically saying, I'm done with you, and I'm done in this house. He then took and left and took all that he had and wasted it on riotous living. He was partying, getting drunk, and doing whatever he wanted. He felt like he had freedom. Well, a famine arose in the land, and he had need for food. He joined himself to someone in the country who sent him out to do the detestable task of watching the pigs. And when he would, would have eaten the food of the pigs, the Bible says he came to himself. And he said in Luke 15 and 18, I will arise and go to my father and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. And his father would not hear of this, but he welcomed them back as a son. And through a party for him, his son that was once dead is alive again. He was lost and now he is found. The son knew his sin was against heaven when he came to himself. And his heart was that of a broken heart. See, God had allowed circumstances to bring him to a place of repentance. 2 Corinthians 7 10 says, For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of. But the sorrow of the world worketh death. His father said he was dead and he was. He was just like us. When we turn our backs on God and turn to sin, we left his house and we are dead in our sins. But when the son came to his senses, he had a whatever I got to do, God mindset. Just let me back in the house, God. Let me back in, Lord. Lord, I want to come back in. I just want to be where you are. If I got to be a servant, I'll do it. I just want to get back in. If I got to eat the scraps from off the table, whatever it takes, God, I want back in. I want to be where you are. I want to eat from the bread of heaven. I want to eat from the bread of life. Lord, whatever I got to do, whatever I have to do, I'll do it. See, when I hear this story, I always think of this scene in the movie Coach Carter, and I want to show you this clip. I'm not telling you to go watch this movie, but I want to show you this clip and let me set it up. See, Coach Carter is a movie based off a real-life story about a high school basketball coach who takes over an inner-city team and tries to reshape the boys whose lives seem to be leading nowhere. They have no future, and he's trying to shape them into upstanding citizens. There is a character in this movie whose name is Timo Cruz, and Timo is always at odds with the coach. He even tried to fight the coach even, but he worked his way back in favor with the coach. And everything was going well until Coach Carter found out that most of his boys were failing in their classes. He suspended all the games until they got their grades back in order, but Timo, he didn't want to hear that, and he quit on the coach and the team. He went to selling drugs with his cousin, but then tragic events befell him, and he was broken. And here we are, open this scene up. He's banging on his coach's door. You can go ahead and play it.
Cruz? I want to come back, coach. What's going on? I want to come back on the team. They shot him. Randy, they shot Randy. I mean, we was just there. We, we was just there. Every, everything was good. Come inside. Come on. Everything was good, coach. I mean, you know. Come inside, son. Come what? on. You don't understand. I want to come back on the team. What do I got to do to play? Don't worry about that, son. Just come inside. I'll do it, okay? Okay, okay. Okay, I got you. What's the word? Come on, come on, come on. Get back with us now. Come on. I can't believe they shot. Just come inside now, all right? Come on. I just want to be on the team. Come on, come on. Whatever you want me to do, I'll do it. Okay. See, that's how I imagine the prodigal son. Life, it took his toil on him, and he couldn't take it anymore. What do I got to do? What does it take for me to get back on the team? That's what Timo Cruz was saying, but in reality, he was saying, I realized I threw my life away. What must I do to get back? I'll do anything. What do I have to do to get my life back? David was issuing the same sentiment in Psalms 51 and 16. He said, for thou desirest not sacrifice, else I would give it. What do I have to do? If sacrifice was what it took, Lord, I would give it. What does it take for me to get back in good graces with you? What does it take for me to get back into your presence? Whatever it is, Lord God, that I'll do. You can only say that from a broken heart. God, I'm calling to you. God, I need you. Thou delightest not in burnt offering. See, God, I know that I can't come to you with this pompous piety anymore. I can't go through the religious motions. I can't just continue to sacrifice. I can't continue to come to this church Sunday after Sunday. You don't delight in that. That's not what you want. Those things are necessary, but that's not what you want. Let's all stand. Let's all stand. I know that we don't offer animal sacrifices anymore, but we have too often come to God with that religious spirit. We try offering the sacrifice of praise here on Sundays. We try to come giving him thanks. We try to do good. We try to bring our tithes and our offerings. But those religious acts, without a heart that has been broken, a heart that is contrite, they are just empty acts. Because the sacrifices of God are broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. Oh God, thou wilt not despise. I know this isn't a message that you guys normally hear from me. But God is calling us to a broken heart. A broken heart is a heart that is pliable to the word of God. One that can be changed. A contrite or remorseful heart shows the necessary humbleness and sorrow for sin. It takes the pride from us and puts God back in the forefront of our lives. Anytime we have to be broken, we can see that God is showing us a fatal flaw in our lives. And we need to repent so that we can come back under his authority and be submitted to him. It's not just tears. It's not just a confession of the mouth. It's a heart condition. It's a heart that is broken. And God can take a broken heart and shape it and mold it. I wish we could all come to the altar. I know some of you won't, but I wish we all would. I wish we would stop living under this pretense that there isn't anything wrong with us. We put on this facade week in and week out. We put on this face 
The church is not a place for, it's not a modeling place. It's a hospital. When are we going to get that to our minds? We are broken. This is a place for the broken. If you're in the church today, you're in the right place. God doesn't want that facade. He wants our hearts. I wish we would stop trying to protect our positions. I wish we would stop trying to protect our names. And I wish we would present to God our brokenness. God, against thee only have I sinned. You know every sin, God. You know every time I miss the mark, Lord Jesus. You know my proclivities. You know my earthly and heart's desires. You know everything about me. I wish we could come to God like that. Open and honest. I wish those who didn't know God, you've never been baptized, you never came to repentance. I wish you could know the feeling of being weight free, guilt free, a pure and a conscious mind that can only come through repentance of Jesus Christ. Through the baptism in Jesus' name and through the receiving of the Holy Ghost, you will receive a new life. He will create in you a new heart and renew a spirit within you, a right one. Against thee only have I sinned, O oh God. I've sinned in my thoughts. I've sinned against my brother. I've sinned against my parents. I've sinned against myself. Ultimately, all sin is against you, God. I acknowledge my sins, Lord God. Forgive me, O oh Lord. Broken. I'm broken, God. I will no longer come under pretense, Lord Jesus. This is no longer false advertisement. I present the real me to you, God, because you already know who I am. here with religious tradition I'm hurt I'm hurting I'm hurting it's okay to be hurting it's okay to be broken this is what the Lord desires from 